Hey everyone, this is Ryan here, and welcome to our final video of the periodontic series. So this is everything that we talked about, and if you haven't already, I would strongly encourage you to watch our full series on periodontics. I broke down the material covered on the board exam into these categories, focusing on the most high-yield information for you. And as you'll see, this information will really help you answer questions on the board exam. So I compiled 15 questions for us to go through together from old release questions, practice books, and questions that I modeled after actual exam questions when I took the exam. So these are going to be very similar to what you will see on test day. So go ahead and pause the video, think through the question, and then we'll go over it together. All right, so for each question, let's break it down and start with what we know. Always start with what you know. So the distance from the CEJ to the base of the pocket is a measure of which of the following. So you may recognize this statement right away as a definition for clinical attachment loss, which happens to be a synonym for clinical attachment level. So A is the correct answer here. Now typically, for the board exam, I stress how important it is to read every word and that every word matters. For example, in oral pathology, condyloma latum and condyloma acuminatum are very, very different things. But in other sections of the exam, there may be something that sounds like what you learned, but maybe it's worded slightly differently, like in this scenario. So in that case, either go with it or to be absolutely sure, try to rule out the other answers because you do have plenty of time when you're taking the exam to do so. So for thinking about clinical attachment level gingival recession, let's think back to our first video where we talked about the periodontal exam. So gingival recession is measured as the distance from the CEJ to the gingival margin. The probing pocket depth is measured from the gingival margin to the base of the pocket. And alveolar bone loss is distance from the original crest of bone, usually about one to two millimeters below the CEJ to start, to the, cr the current level of the crest of the bone. So all of these definitions are slightly different from what this one is, from CEJ to the base of the pocket is clinical attachment loss or clinical attachment level. So A is the correct answer. All right, question number two, go ahead and pause the video and then we'll talk about this. All right, so which type of periodontal disease most often requires antibiotic therapy? Now this is a high yield fact from our adjunctive therapy video and I always stress those in red text in the videos. So the A form of periodontitis, most often of all the disease types, need to be, needs to be treated with A for antibiotics. So the only viable option for this question, the only viable answer for this question would be B, localized aggressive periodontitis. All right, question three. Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll go over this together. All right, what is the primary treatment objective of guided tissue regeneration? So for this question, and for many boards questions, we don't need to know any of the nitty gritty details about the mechanism of guided tissue regeneration here, just the high yield facts. So guided tissue regeneration or periodontal regeneration is all about regenerating the periodontium. And if that was an answer choice, we would just pick it, but that would be a bit too easy. So let's go through each, each answer choice here. Formation of long junctional epithelium is a mechanism of natural repair by the body, but this is not an objective of regenerative therapy. Remember, there's that difference between repair and regeneration. So that one's not right. B, promoting growth of epithelial cells. Well, promoting growth of cells sounds nice, 
but guided tissue regeneration is promoting growth of bone, PDL, and cementum, not epithelial cells. So it's the wrong type of cell. Remember, these are the types of cells we're trying to prevent the downgrowth of by using the barrier membrane. So that one's incorrect as well. Let's skip ahead to D, reducing inflammation. Well, reducing inflammation is a goal of periodontal therapy in general, yes, but not this type of treatment specifically. So that one's not quite specific enough. How about C, coronal movement of PDL? Now this is just a fancy way of saying regeneration of periodontal ligament. You can think of it like clinical attachment loss is apical movement of the PDL, whereas periodontal regeneration is coronal movement of the PDL. So this is the correct answer. All right, question number four. Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, which type of bacteria is routinely involved in cases of chronic periodontitis? Now this one is just simply name recognition. And one of our high yield facts from the plaque video was that the AA bacteria is for the aggressive type, whereas P. gingivalis is for the chronic type. So the answer here is A, and that's it. Now, if you didn't remember that one key fact, we could rule out AA for aggressive, P. intermedia and C. rectus are part of the orange complex, which isn't quite as pathogenic as these two, which are part of the red complex. So then you'd be down to a 50-50 shot between A and B. But of course, remembering the link between P. gingivalis and chronic periodontitis would make this question very, very straightforward. All right, question five. Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, which of the following is not a feature of the modified Widman flap? Now this one is a little bit tricky, but let's start by eliminating the incorrect answer choices. So the modified Widman flap is by definition a full thickness flap because it includes lifting up the periosteum. So that rules out A right away. It's also the standard flap used in open flap debridements because the primary goal of this flap is to provide improved visual access to the periodontally involved tissues so that you can do scaling and root planing with direct vision. So the modified Woodman flap is all about improved vision and access. So that rules out answer choice D, which definitely is a feature of the modified Woodman flap. Also, you may remember this picture where there were three horizontal incisions, the reverse bevel, the sulcular, and the interdental. So these horizontal incisions referring to the precise horizontal incisions of answer choice C. So that rules out C, and that leaves us with B, reduction of the osseous defect. Now with this flap, the whole goal is to be as atraumatic as possible. So it makes sense that there would be no reduction of bone performed with the modified Woodman flap. Instead, we perform a very atraumatic flap, remove calculus that's there, and rely on tissue healing. So there's no ostectomy with the modified Widman flap. So the answer is B. And if you're interested, that's actually what was modified about it. The original Widman flap was a lot more aggressive and could involve reduction of bone. All right, question number six. What is the most important factor in determining prognosis of a tooth affected by periodontal disease. Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll go over it together. All right, so if you watched my previous videos, you'll know I promised you this would be a question, and it's likely to come up on the board exam. So clinical attachment loss is the most important factor in determining the prognosis because it's based on a fixed point, being the CEJ. The CEJ of a tooth will not change. The CEJ is a fixed 
reference point as opposed to, say, the gingival margin, which could move. So the amount of attachment loss is by far the most important factor in determining the prognosis of a tooth with periodontal disease. It's more accurate than probing depth, than tooth mobility, presence of frication involvement, all of those things. Now I do want to mention, if you get a boards question that asks the most important factor for periodontal success, say the success of scaling and root planing, then bleeding on probing would be the answer because the absence of bleeding on probing indicates resolution of inflammation and success of therapy. So I would remember success goes with bleeding on probing, prognosis goes with clinical attachment loss. All right, question number seven. Go ahead, read through this, pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so this one is pretty straightforward. We talked a lot about how a patient's role is just as important as the provider's role in periodontal disease and resolution. So let's read through this. A patient's compliance with scheduled maintenance visits has no effect on the long-term retention of periodontally treated teeth. Frequency of maintenance visits has no correlation with the development of periodontal pockets and gingivitis. So that is a lot of text. But remember, patient compliance, motivation, and maintenance frequency all play a critical role in the outcome. So don't overthink it. The question is basically proposing that these factors are not important, but we know they are important. So both of the statements are false. So the answer is D. All right, question number eight. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this question together. All right, so distal wedge surgery does not involve which of the following techniques. So distal wedge surgery we talked about briefly. It's frequently performed after wisdom teeth are extracted because the bone fill can be rather poor, leaving a periodontal defect distal to the terminal molars. So surgery involves a full thickness flap down to the bone with a V-shaped incision in the mandible, parallel incisions in the maxilla. So of the answer choices, the one that does not belong, since it is a full thickness flap, it cannot be a partial thickness flap. So the answer is B. All right, question number nine. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this together. All right, so what is the mechanism of action of doxycycline as used in host modulation therapy? So there's a lot of text here, some really long answer choices. So make sure when you get something like this to read the question carefully and read through the answer choices very carefully. Now let's go through each one of these. Answer choice A inhibits bacterial protein synthesis by binding to the 30S ribosomal subunit. This is a classic board's trap answer. This is doxycycline's use, but as an antibiotic. But remember, for host modulation, it's a sub-antimicrobial dose, which means it's less than the usual dose. So it can't do this. This is not its function for periodontal disease. It's not being used and prescribed as an antibiotic. So A is incorrect inhibits the formation of peptidoglycan crosslinks in the bacterial cell wall, you may recognize this as the mechanism of penicillins, so that is also incorrect. Answer choice C prevents nucleic acid synthesis by disrupting the DNA of microbial cells. Again, all of these are targeting bacteria, and this would be the a mechanism of metronidazole, which is an antibiotic used in periodontal disease, but not as part of host modulation therapy. So that leaves us with answer choice D, prevents further breakdown of periodontal tissues by blocking collagenase. And this is the correct answer because it blocks the host response, 
where the collagenase is not from bacteria, it's from the host, where it's responding to the presence of plaque bacteria, and the collagenase destroys its own tissues. It's destroying the host itself. So host modulation is all about modulating or, re or reducing the uh, impact of the host response. So the answer here is D. All right, question number 10. Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, for most patients affected with periodontitis, what is the recommended interval for maintenance appointments? So this one is another sort of straightforward um, recognition of the, some of the numbers that we had talked about. Most patients undergoing treatment for periodontal disease disease should be seen for maintenance visits every three months for the first year at least. So we have two magic numbers to remember for the board exam, four to eight weeks for the periodontal reevaluation, and then every three months for maintenance visits. So the answer choice here is B. All right, question number 11. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this together. All right, so which bony defect responds best to regenerative therapy? Again, regenerative therapy, periodontal regeneration, guided tissue regeneration, all of those are in the same umbrella. So the first thing we need to do for this question is to translate these answer choices into the same language. And what I, what I mean by that is we have one here with a number, other things with names. Let's translate all of these into how many walls each of these defects has. So one wall defect, of course, has one. Hemiseptal is a one-walled defect, hemi meaning half. So only half, one half of the defect has a wall. Shallow crater. Crater is a two-walled defect. Shallow, not all that important in this case. And trough is a three-walled defect. So now we have all the answer choices translated into similar language. So now we can answer the question more confidently. So the more walls you have and the deeper the defect, the more surface area there is and natural bone there is to support and protect the graft and also to provide bone cells to populate the defect with new bone. So if, let's say, circumferential were an option, that's a four wall defect, then that would be the correct answer. But in this case, the most walls we have available are three, so trough A would be our correct answer. And of course, here's a review of our one-walled, two-walled, and three-walled defect. And so the three-wall defect of the three of these provides the most safety and protection and surface area for successful graft or regeneration. So the correct answer here would be A. All right, question number 12. Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll go over this together. All right, the predominant inflammatory cells in the periodontal pocket are which of the following? So this one could be a little bit tricky because all of these cells are present in the pocket, and we talked about all of them, but one of them should stand out among the rest as being the most important. It's the one that's the first line of defense. It migrates from the blood vessels just below the pocket, and it's the one that makes MMPs, or collagenases that destroy the collagen. And so neutrophils is what I'm describing, and the answer is C. So again, this would be a classic don't overthink it, just because all these are in the pocket. There is one that stands out that's most important, and that would be the neutrophils. So go with the most obvious choice, and the answer is C. All right, question number 13. Go ahead and pause the video, then we'll go over this together. All right, what are the characteristics of the primary bacterial colonizers of the tooth in dental plaque formation? 
So the important trend that I said to remember is that the early layers of plaque that are directly on the tooth tend to be gram positive. And as the plaque grows out, the outer layers tend to be gram negative. So plaque grows from gram positive to gram negative. So the early plaque and the primary colonizers are going to be gram positive. So we can automatically rule out A and C. Now primary colonizers include bacteria like Streptococcus and Actinomyces, which are facultative. Now if you didn't remember that, the early bacteria still have access to oxygen before the plaque starts to grow subgingivally, which would tend to be more anaerobic. So since we're talking about early plaque, we're talking about gram positive, and we're talking about bacteria that still have access to oxygen that can function in the presence of oxygen, that describes facultative bacteria. So the correct answer here would be B. All right, question number 14. Go ahead and read through this, pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, order the following types of cells by their ability to populate a wound area during the healing process from fastest to slowest. And so a helpful image to think about would be this one. And I removed uh, the numbers in this image that we had gone over during our surgical therapy with regenerative therapy. So for periodontal regeneration, we want the PDL and the bone to grow. Those are the most valuable tissue types. But naturally, the epithelial cells and the connective tissue cells tend to grow faster, and we have to prohibit their downgrowth. Remember, we place a barrier membrane here to protect the bone and the PDL and allow them to fill in the defect. So, for the exact order of growth, we know epithelial and connective tissue has to come before PDL and bone marrow, but how do we exactly order them? So, think of it. Now, how I think of it for the exact order of growth is the softest tissue type has the faster growing cells, while the harder tissue types have slower growing cells. So from softest to hardest, we have epithelial, then connective tissue, then periodontal ligament, and finally bone being the toughest. So this, you can also think of this order from least desirable tissue type being epithelial cells to the most desirable tissue type being the bone. So whichever way you think about it would be, um, whichever way is most helpful to you, that's how I would remember it for the board exam. So the correct order from fastest to slowest would be two, three, one, and then four. So that fits along with answer choice B. So the first day of the board exam will be 400 questions with periodontics questions just like the ones we talked about sprinkled throughout. On the second day, you'll have 100 more questions that are case-based. So they'll give you information on a patient with some clinical photos and x-rays, and otherwise the questions are very similar. Here's an example. So go ahead and read through this question, and then we'll talk about it together. So tooth number seven has been restored with an all ceramic crown with a plaque retentive subgingival margin producing inflammation. According to the periodontal charting provided, what is the mid buccal probing pocket depth of this tooth? Now for the board exam, they'll probably give you clinical charting for the whole mouth or at least just one arch. Here I've simplified it and just provided the three buccal readings for tooth number seven. So if we're trying to find out the probing pocket depth, we're always going to be given enough information in the question with the clinical um, information provided to be able to answer the question. There won't be any guesswork here. And lucky for us, we're given, if we're talking about the mid buccal uh, reading, we're given the recession and we're given the clinical attachment loss. So if we hone in on that middle column, we have all the information that we need. So the equation that I talked about in the very first video in the series is what we need to solve this problem. 
That is, the clinical attachment loss is equal to the amount of uh, recession plus the, the probing pocket depth. So probing pocket depth plus recession equals clinical attachment loss. And so if we were to make this a math equation, x plus 1 is equal to 4, and we can solve for x, and that would make this have to be 3. A 3 millimeter pocket depth with 1 millimeter of recession equals 4 millimeters of clinical attachment loss. So to answer the question, the correct answer would be C, 3 millimeters. All right, so that's all I have for this video. Those were 15 questions that are modeled after actual board exam questions and are very similar to what you will see on test day. So hopefully you found this series helpful in your studies so you can feel confident going into test day with the knowledge that you can do very, very well. So thank you so much for watching, everyone. I really appreciate the support, and we'll see you all in the next video series.